Excellent. <clears throat> so I'm here to talk about how uh, your CSS is a mess. Um, so obviously, this seems to be a pretty uh, DevOps kind of heavy crowd. How many of you have to do front end development? Good show of hands. Excellent. So hopefully you know what I've uh, been talking about. So um, I, I came across this tweet a while back, uh, observing that the maximum number of people who can productively, simultaneously work on CSS is one. How many of you agree with that? Okay. Um, so I used to freelance, run my own company um, called Snook.ca. Uh, now, as Snook.ca, I was one person. Um, that meant that um, I was the only person that ever had to touch the code, um, the only person that had to deploy the code, um, the only person who ever had to maintain the code. And you know what was great was that I, when I do client work, uh, I, I put together this beautiful CSS, deliver it to the client, and never have to see it again. And in actuality, you know how good was my CSS? I don't know because. I, I delivered the product and I've moved on to other projects. And you know, the, I think this is how a lot of companies work, um, even with small teams. A lot of agencies work this way. They build it, they deliver it, and they don't really touch it again. Now, uh, I, I now work for a company called Shopify. Um, and at Shopify, we're a team of four designers and five developers. Um, so we're still a fairly small team in that we are just that. We're one team working on one project. We all work in the same office. It's really easy for us to turn around and go, okay, can you wait a second? I just need to merge in some changes and deploy. Um, but before that and after the, the freelance, uh, I worked for this company called Yahoo, uh, you know, 13,000 employees. Um, it's a pretty large organization. Uh, our team had 30 designers and they were working with 200 engineers. Uh, and the way their process used to work was that their designers would uh, design these Photoshop comps, deliver them to a team, such as the team for Yahoo Mail or Messenger, Calendar, uh, and that team would build that stuff out. Six months later, they would deliver it, and all the designers would go, yeah, I don't think that's quite what I wanted. Um, and it was because it was just, that was their, their, their waterfall process, throw it over the wall and, and move on. Uh, so when I came on board, we ended up starting a, a new team of prototypers. Now, prototyping as an industry, we, we think of like somebody building something and throwing it away. Um, I, I thought, you know what, let's do something a little bit different where we actually build something that is hopefully good enough that we can push into production. And so as a team of prototypers, we actually worked with the designers. We were part of the design team to build out all that HTML and CSS and front-end code that would get integrated into the products with the engineers. So we became this liaison between the two to help get everything integrated. Uh, we were working with multiple teams and working with multiple projects. So obviously it's a completely different level of scale in between these two things. Now, I think the thing is, is that people look at CSS and think that it's really easy. Uh, you know, you have a bunch of HTML, you throw some CSS at it, and magically it becomes a site. Uh, you know, we have CSS selectors, we have CSS uh, properties, and then we get CSS that starts to look like this. Does this look like CSS on your projects? Wow, you guys must have great stuff. <laughs> this, this scares me, because this to me is like a step away from inline styles. And if you think I'm just making this up, I am copying and pasting this from an actual project. This is a step above inline style. Somebody didn't feel comfortable writing style equals display block, so they created a block class, made it important, so nothing else could override it, and threw this into their CSS. This made them feel better. Um, this makes me feel like this. Um, I'm not loving it. Um, okay, how about this? This is from MySpace. And we see these really long selector chains, right? So. There's a lot of stuff here, but what's interesting is, is that the stuff that they really cared about was like this stuff at the end. So they're creating a lot of extra selectors in order to get to what they want. Now, like I said, I'm, I'm definitely not perfect. This is CSS from my site right now, but here's the thing, I wrote this four years ago, and I haven't updated my site since. And so as a result of that, 
uh, I don't have to worry about the maintainability. Again, my code can be as good or as bad as it uh, could ever be, but if I'm never touching it again, then it really doesn't matter. A lot of, when it comes to CSS maintenance, it, it's just that, you know, you need to have something to maintain, mm. something that is in a constant state of flux. So, you know, I have these long selector chains. This, to me, at the time, made a lot of sense, but what did I care about? I cared about the stuff at the end. I cared about the author name. I cared about the comment number. Those are the only things that I really cared about. Okay, here's an example from Drupal. Uh, on the Drupal website, I've taken out a bunch of stuff, but you can kind of get a sense of what's happening here, right? This is a horizontal nav. They have two of them in two different places, and they duplicate exactly the same code in both of those places. They haven't abstracted away these repeating patterns. So anytime they add something new to the website, they build the CSS just for that component, ignoring all the other CSS that they've already written. So you can imagine a site, as it gets larger, so does the CSS, and it just becomes this large mass of code. Here's another bit from a project um, that I think that we often see on a project. So this is one CSS file. This is what we used to actually have to maintain. And I think this is the way a lot of people coded, right? Like, you have one CSS file, and I'm just going to add stuff to the bottom. And uh, what ends up happening in that kind of situation is that we start dealing with the CSS. We twiddle things here. We change things here. And they have all these dependencies throughout an entire project, and we keep fiddling until we just kind of get frustrated and there we go. <laughs> then again, I think some people kind of have a bit of a Stockholm syndrome when it comes to CSS. You know, despite the frustration, we got, we're just happy puppies because we get to play with CSS all day. Um, so as a result of the work that I was doing at Yahoo and realizing that we're working on these sort of large projects, um, I needed to come up with something that uh, was scalable and modular. And um, I decided to write down a lot of the thoughts that I was thinking about when it came to developing uh, websites with CSS. And so I created this architecture for CSS. Um, I wrote this book. Uh, I call it Smacks. Uh, and in it, I talk about a number of different concepts for maintaining CSS uh, for large projects. Um, but using techniques that also work for small projects. Um, so today I'm only going to talk about uh, three things. Uh, one of them is categorization. Uh, second thing is naming convention. And the last thing is decoupling HTML from CSS. Um, I, that last one I'm sure sounds kind of weird because obviously CSS is designed to style HTML. So what does that decoupling mean? Uh, but trust me, it'll, it'll make sense when we get there. So categorization. Um, I think that historically, again, when we build our CSS, we've cared about the HTML elements on the page. So what do we do is we build a selector to select that HTML element, and uh, we want it to do something. Uh, so we want it to have a certain width, a certain height. Uh, we want it to have certain borders. And so we end up adding all these different styles to it to get the look and feel that we want. However, in our project, we have certain things that that CSS is doing. And so it's about categorizing uh, our CSS into specific roles. Um, so in looking at it, um, I, I see that there's five main uh, categories. One is base. Uh, the second is layout. The third is module. We've got state. And we've got themes. And that every bit of CSS that you're writing is serving one of these five goals. OK, so what is base? Base is your CSS uh, reset. Um, this is what do your HTML elements look like at its very core. Whether you use the CSS reset in itself doesn't matter. Um, I personally don't use CSS resets. Um, I'm a big fan of the CSS that I'm going to write should serve a purpose. And the purpose shouldn't be to set everything to zero only for me to style things back up again. Um, what I've often asked people to do at the end of a project is take your CSS reset and delete it and see what changes. And chances are probably only two things will change. Your nav will change, because most people strip out the margins and paddings on nav, uh, on list items, and uh, your margin and padding on the body. Right? Those are the, like, sort of the core things. So if you had that as your CSS reset versus like these large 2, 3K, I mean, 2, 3K doesn't sound like a lot, but that's still 2, 3K that you're writing that you don't need to write. 
Okay, so we've, we've, we've got our core, we've got our base is what every HTML element on the page should look like by default. Uh, and then on top of that, we need a shell. We need these elements that are gonna contain our content. So in this case with Yahoo Mail, we've got a lot of content on this page, but what are the core layout pieces that we're dealing with? We're dealing with a header, we're dealing with a sidebar, and we're dealing with the co main content area. This is a very common pattern, of course, that we see on pretty much every single site that we work on. So for example, on PayPal, we have our header, we've got our main content area, we've got our sidebar, we may have a grid system that we're using, but we're, we're defining these buckets on the page that all our content should go into. Amazon, very similar, we've got this header, we've got our content area, we've got our sidebar. You know, we might have a grid system down at the bottom that we might be using for uh, particular pieces, but that we've got these, these containers, this shell that we wanna then put everything inside. So what are we putting inside them? Uh, I call them modules. Um, they're essentially your content pieces. So for example, you might have tabs, you might have a customized list, you might have buttons, uh, you know, this navigation, all this stuff that you wanna put in there, uh, you know, all, all these little pieces, these chunks, these are the modules, um, and these become the patterns that we wanna abstract away. So if we look at the PayPal site, for example, what are the modules that we might see? Well, we might see something, for example, the inputs. So with the inputs, we have you know, the, the, the gray background, we have the little button off to the right, we've got the rounded corners. This is this pattern that we want to repeat for all these types of inputs. The password input is very much the same way. We have buttons. In this case, there was a gray button, there's a blue button, um, there's probably other buttons throughout the site. You know, there's a certain typography, a certain padding, um, maybe a little bit of a drop shadow, um, the gradients, all this stuff that we want to define, and, uh, and then we want to encapsulate that into a chunk that we can repeat and reuse. Here's another piece where we've got this content chunk on the right-hand side, um, and you know, we can kind of see here where we've got this repeating pattern, right? This piece that repeats again and again along the sidebar that we want to style and reuse. You know, maybe this is a chunk that we can then use throughout the site. Maybe there are other pages where we want to have this stuff in the sidebar that we want to design and make look consistent. So that is a module that we want to separate. And a module is just that, it's a visual pattern. It's not necessarily a part of the page. As an industry, we've often looked at, you know, let's style a page and then plan for the differences. I know that uh, for a lot of the projects that I worked on, um, especially as an agency, especially with content-driven sites, you have two templates. You have your home and your inside. So which page did you start with? Maybe the home page, maybe the inside page. You styled all the CSS that you needed for that, and then you would add in that extra little chunk for the home page. For larger projects, it doesn't really scale well because then you just keep adding, okay, well, here's the products page and all the stuff I need for that. Well, here's the events page and here's all the CSS I need for that. And then we just like create these little comments around these sections to describe all the different contexts um, in which you know, these different styles need to live in. And really it should be about building this system of components that you can reuse. So Amazon, for example, very similar. You know, where we might have this content chunk off on the right hand side where the image is to the left. Uh, you know, there's the, the number, there's the title, there's the, um, the vendor, the pricing, all these little pieces of the design are repeated down the side. So that's that modular chunk, that's that design pattern that we wanna reuse. We have the, the books with the title on uh, underneath the, the product shot. And again, we, here's that chunk that we wanna reuse. Now, we may have you know, this chunk, but we have variations, right? We have this module, um, but we have variations on that module that we need to define. And those are what I call submodules. So a submodule, um, in this case, we have buttons. We've got search buttons, large buttons, small buttons, dark buttons. But they're all built off of a base. And therefore, the variations are usually just really subtle things, uh, where we're only changing maybe two to three styles uh, per component. And this allows us to sort of categorize all these things as um, part and parcel, that they are together uh, for this particular project. Now sometimes these kind of things can be a little bit subtler to pick out. 
Um, we were working on this project where we have these little drop-down menus. When I click on the Actions button, we get this little drop-down menu. Uh, it's got little rounded corners. It's got this blue links um, inside with this drop shadow. And then we want to build this search component. Do uh, type in it, hit enter, and we get this little drop-down autocomplete thing. And what was interesting, this is that the first pass, the designer that was working on this built this all as one component. Again, it was concerned about the context on the page. Well, it's a search box, so I have the search input, I've got the search results, um, and everything was all based around this component. But the thing is, is that the visual style between these two is surprisingly similar. There's only a few variations between the two. Um, so, you know, we have a blue link, we have a drop shadow, um, we only have a couple components that we needed to add to this over what we had before, where we have the icon on the left and we had this little footer that appeared there. So instead of trying to separate these as two individual components, what we did is define it as one with these variations that we were adding on. So again, it's recognizing what those visual patterns are throughout your project instead of looking at the context to which these components live in. I hope that wasn't me. Okay, so, you know, we talk about modules, um, and a module represents an HTML element on the page, and it has stuff inside it. Uh, but when you were looking at, like, okay, I'm creating a class name that exists on a particular element, uh, that is a module. The thing is, is that modules can consist of other components that are still related to that module. So, for example, a modal dialog. So within a modal dialog, you might have a header, you might have a body, and you might have a footer. The contents of those, you know, here, this modal content, this form that I'm having here, could change. And I don't want to care about the content in there. I don't want to style things based on the fact that it's in a modal dialog. I want to separate these styles. So what is my module? My module is the modal dialog itself, and then the components are the header, the body, and the footer. So, if we're looking at this as our code, you can see the sort of the naming convention kind of trying to clarify um, the intent of what these things are doing. We have modal, so that is the module uh, in this particular case. Uh, if this was a large modal dialog, a different variation, um, that is the submodule that is being defined here. Um, so those, both of those name classes are on the, the, the root HTML element. And that is the module and submodule defined. But now you can see there's modal header, there's modal body, and modal footer. And the naming convention, again, the fact that these are on other HTML elements are showing that all this stuff is related, that they're all together um, part of the same thing. Whereas if you look at the, the contents of, say, the buttons, the different naming convention here um, is showing that these are different things, different components that are unrelated to where they exist. Okay, so we've covered three so far. We've covered base, layout, and uh, module. Uh, then we get into state. Now, state is kind of like a submodule in that it is a variation. It's a visual style difference on a particular module. Uh, but it relates specifically to uh, JavaScript uh, or other types of state management. So for example, uh, where you have JavaScript that when I come in and I click on that button, I have my default state. That's going to be my base module. And then when I click on it, I have the state that needs to represent that it's active. I might have a default state uh, for this navigation and then a disabled state. So all these variations um, that I'm planning, I'm saying here, there's a JavaScript dependency. Um, state needs to be applied or removed from a particular object. And then lastly, there's themes. Theming in this context really kind of refers to user configuration where they can come in and modify their changes. Um, it's not specifically you know, adding color to any project, uh, because I feel like if you don't have, if the users can't come in and customize their project, then the need to separate those styles out are less relevant to me. You can use something like a preprocessor to create variables and just drop those variables in. Having to separate those styles out um, is less important. So when I refer to theming here, I'm referring specifically to user configuration. So for example, if you have uh, you know, Yahoo Mail, purple, uh, Yahoo loves purple, um, 
but maybe you don't, right? Maybe you want some green grass and blue skies because, you know, like email is stressful and you just want to relax. And what's more relaxing than, you know, blue skies? But we didn't want to send down, like we had a little modal dialog that you can open and click to choose the theme that you wanted. And you could preview that theme right away. Well, you don't want to have to download that entire CSS file, every single piece of the project all over again, just to preview that. All you care about is what's changed. And what's changed here, um, in this case, we made all our themes six colors and one background image. And that allowed us to create themes really quickly, and it meant that the, the chunk that had changed was really small. So to be able to preview those changes was really easy, really quick, essentially instantaneous, which was really nice. And then once the user saved their change and came back, then we would bundle all that up together and cache it on their system. Some of that can also apply to typography. So in this case, um, a lot of the Asian languages, um, just the, the characters are so detailed that they don't work at the same font size um, as Latin characters. And therefore, we need to increase the font size throughout the project. Again, this is a user configuration. They can set their language. And when they do, we want to make sure that the font sizes are reflected. Now, what does categorization mean? What is the purpose of this? And to me, it's important to have your CSS and your HTML do one thing and one thing only. Uh, there's an article. Uh, you can check it out, snk.ms slash 1r. Um, is a little short URL for, for you. Uh, an article called The Single Responsibility Theory, uh, where uh, Harry Roberts had uh, taken this concept and applied it to CSS. And it's something that I um, talk about in SMACs uh, to a certain degree, where uh, we, we want to separate our concerns. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of what I mean. So let's say you have a grid system, right? Your grid system is performing a certain purpose, in this case, layout. Um, and then we might have grid columns. Now, within that, we have a specific module. This could be a playlist, it could be a list of events, whatever it is, I have something that I need to represent in a grid view. Now, it may seem like, okay, well, I'm gonna just combine these two things onto the same element, and this will serve my purpose. Um, and, you know, for the CSS that you might see here, you know, if you have the opportunity to use nth child, then maybe we can do a grid system really easily here. The problem is, is that we can run into a risk where the styles that we've defined for one thing start clashing with the styles for another thing. And it's these types of situations that we want to avoid. Uh, so by separating those pieces out, where I'm gonna actually make that module a new HTML element so it can stand alone um, and place it inside my layout, that means that I I lessen the risk of conflict, right? So in this sense, if you could imagine, um, you know, from a back-end programming perspective where you have uh, this class where it's really doing two different things, that you want to pull that class out into a different file uh, and, and have it focus on what it needs to do and have the other object focus on what it needs to do. This is essentially the same concept here. I just want to pull that object out um, so it's doing its only its own thing. So I'm gonna look at a more subtle example, one that might not seem so obvious to begin with. So in this case, maybe you have um, this unordered list of items. Again, the module could be a playlist, list of events, whatever it is, um, but I no longer have the same class. Uh, I, I don't have two classes applied to the same thing, so this feels like, oh, I'm not, I'm not mixing up those two things. But if we look at the CSS for this, we can kind of see that it's basically the same thing as what we had before. We're still targeting that list item. We're still making that element perform a layout role. And so again, I would recommend that we can chunk this stuff out. Now there's another reason why I really like to do this, and that comes to templating. The fact that we can now separate our concerns such that that grid system is now by itself. It is just the grid. At Yahoo, we did this quite a bit, and it was great to be able to get to this point where we did all of our prototyping completely outside of the project. Uh, we could build out a component, uh, whether it was a modal dialog, an entire screen, or just a couple buttons, and we could take just that HTML, and here's the thing, we could also take just the CSS for that particular chunk, and we could test it 
We could build it, and we didn't have to worry about anything else on a page. Because how did we usually test CSS on a particular project? We open up the browser, we hit refresh. Okay, everything looks good. Okay, well, now I've got 30 other pages. Did anything else break? So I click through on all the other pages to make sure that everything works. We don't have a lot of uh, really good testing environments for validating that the CSS has rendered correctly. You know, if, if we say, okay, well, it, it's got to have these properties, um, that could be one way that we could do that, but there's not a, a ton of testing tools. And so what I want to be able to do is, is isolate that component so I can test it by itself. And so having separated onto its own element meant that I can now test the grid system by itself, and now I can test that module by itself. The other thing is here, if I had the module on a list item, it's really hard for me to test that list item by itself. It needs to be in a list. Um, so what I like to do is, is make sure that my modules exist on an element that can exist by itself. In this case, a div. I'm not afraid to throw divs into a project. I know a lot of people say, well, it's divitis, you're just gonna have a ton of divs. Um, but that isn't really the case. If you start just being very considerate on how you are building out those individual components, um, you don't run into these sort of huge, massive HTML projects. Uh, everything becomes small, compact, easy to work with. And so categorization is about isolation. So defining what are these roles that are, are HTML and the CSS that is designed to style that, um, what role is it playing, and then keeping those roles separated. So just like keeping modules and layout separate, I'd also recommend to keep modules separate. So if you have a button style and uh, maybe a menu style, you might think, well, they're kind of working together where you click on the button and it shows a menu. I'm gonna create styles that are gonna link those two together. And I would say, no, keep them separate so that all the states, everything that you need to test that menu is gonna be completely separate. Because you may find yourself in a situation where down the road where you're adding this menu that is no longer attached just to a button. And again, you know, the, the example that I showed you earlier was a great example of that where we had this menu that was attached to a button and was pretty much the case throughout the project until we started working on this search component. Well, suddenly we have something that's a very similar visual style. We can repeat this pattern. But if we had linked it very specifically to that button, we would have to write more code in order to override those changes. And those are the types of things that we want to avoid. Okay, so we've covered the first topic. Uh, we'll jump into the second one, naming convention. So for me, naming convention clarifies intent. And we saw that one example with the modal dialog, got a glimpse at some of the naming convention. Um, but I'm gonna touch on one topic first, and that is the idea of using classes over IDs. Now I'm gonna say, I'm not as dogmatic to say never use IDs, um, but here's the thing, when you're styling something, do you wanna start at the easiest level or at the hardest level? You know, do you wanna, the moment you put an ID on something, the moment you need to override that style, you need to add another ID or another class on top of that ID selector, or you start throwing important at things. Um, you know, you create these long selector chains just to beat out the style that you created before. Uh, you're making things more complicated right off the bat. So if we look at our specificity chart, uh, you know, we essentially have four categories. We have element, we have class, ID, and inline. Element styles aren't gonna give us a lot of flexibility. Um, there was actually an article on Smashing Magazine uh, a few months ago uh, where uh, the author had uh, said that you could actually style an entire site using just element selectors alone, that there was enough HTML5 elements uh, that you could have enough uniqueness to style an entire page. And sure enough, he had taken his blog and styled it completely with element selectors. The problem is, is that's not very scalable. It doesn't really um, allow you to maintain a project. Again, taking a look at the CSS from my site, if it hasn't changed in four years, it doesn't matter how good or bad the code is if I never have to change it. So obviously, element selectors aren't really gonna help us out too much, and we want to avoid inline styles. So we're kind of left with these two in the middle. And again, the moment you add an ID selector, you've just made life a little bit more complicated for you. So to take a look at a quick example, um, so let's say we have a bunch of links on our page. These are blue links, 039 is kind of a blue with a 
tad bit of green in there. Uh, we have these subdued links, um, let's say on a sidebar where uh, we don't want them to stand out, we just want them gray to blend in. And then we want to have some uh, cancel links. Um, in this case, we know right off the bat that we're only ever going to have one cancel link on a page. You know, let's say it's a form, we have the next button, and there's this link over here, I'm only going to have one on a page, and so we want to make it red. And so we think, okay, well, I'm gonna make, since I only have one on the page, I'm going to make it a, an ID, and that'll work fine, right? So I've got our links, I've got our subdued links, and we've got our cancel links. But sure enough, the client comes back and says, you know what, I have this one particular form where I don't want that link to be read. I really need them to click on the next button. I don't want to draw attention to the cancel. Um, can we just make that one gray? Can we make that one subdued as well? So you take that cancel link and you throw a subdued class on it and start thinking, ah, that's still red, right? Because we look at the specificity of this and the specificity says is that this red is gonna win out. The ID automatically wins over that. And so, sure, you know, if it's a Monday, I might take that challenge. <laughs> but maybe on a Friday, I'm just gonna throw important on all the things. And sure enough, this works, right? I've solved my problem. I can now move on to the next one. Um, but this, you know, this should not be something that we just automatically go to on any particular project. Try to avoid throwing important on things. Uh, another way we could have solved that problem is that we could have done this, right? I started doubling up on my selectors. I could have done pound cancel dot subdue. This would have worked as well. But again, you can start seeing situations where we add more and more classes, more things that our links need to do, and we start getting into these weird situations. How we could have solved this problem is actually just made it a class. And now as a result of that, I can add that cancel class to a particular link and it's gonna work. The ID can still remain there. If I have JavaScript dependencies that need to come in where if I click on that cancel link, I need to unset a bunch of state where you know, I have stored a bunch of stuff in the JavaScript layer and I need to remove that kind of stuff, I can still have that ID in there. From a CSS perspective, I don't care about it. From a JavaScript perspective, I, it, it can deal with the ID from a CSS layer. I just wanna deal with the classes for what I need. Okay, with that set aside, let's start looking at actual naming convention. So the first thing for me is where we have this button, right? If I have this button, um, I don't like to have any hyphens in it, um, and this is just, this is the root node. This is my module. And then every single sub-module from that, any variation of that, still includes the prefix. So having that button prefix says to me when I'm looking at the HTML, when I'm looking at the CSS, no matter what context I'm looking at, I'm gonna understand that this bar, button large is part of the button module. Now, a very common question that I get at this point is, is well, why didn't you just do dot .btn.large? Dot Create a large class, add it to your button class, and it would do exactly the same thing. The problem here is, is that the context at which you are looking for something may not be uh, exactly the same. So yes, I could do dot .button.large, dot and if I'm looking at my CSS, I know what's going on. If I'm looking at my HTML and I see button space large, I have a pretty good sense of what's going on, but I won't know until I look at the CSS for sure. But here's the thing. Somebody comes in and says, can you just find me all the large buttons on your project and change them to medium, right? They're just, they're way too big. So you do a search for large but suddenly you haven't found just large buttons, you found large modal dialogues, you found large inputs, anywhere else where you might have used a large class as a way of modifying an existing object. And so you might you know, hopefully get around it with regex expressions and maybe that'll solve the problem. Uh, you know, but did somebody do button space large or did they put another class in there? Or did they do large space button? And it's these types of contexts that make it a lot harder to understand exactly what's going on. How many people here use a CSS preprocessor? Pretty good crowd. So I'm sure a lot of you who do are probably using nesting, a uh, very common approach where you can take a selector and nest it inside of another one. Here's another problem with that that I find, is that if I had a large class nested inside of a button class, 
Sure, the generated CSS would work well. Imagine doing a git commit and like GitHub, you're looking at the pull request and it's showing like the first three lines and the last three lines of that pull request and all you see is a large class. And you're like, large, okay, well, what context is this pull request? What am I solving? And again, it's, it's understanding that, you know, this piece of code, this one little piece can exist in any number of different contexts. So having this naming convention that really clarifies that intent makes it absolutely clear that these things are all related. Now I talked about states, states being JavaScript uh, driven. What I do is, is I prefix those with is to indicate that there's a JavaScript dependency. So when I see this, is button active, is button disabled, I know that JavaScript is coming in here and applying these classes to the elements on the page. What I recommend as well is that at a JavaScript level that you're only applying states whenever you can. Avoid applying inline CSS with JavaScript. So if you're using something like jQuery, and you do .css, open bracket, you're probably gonna wanna rethink that. Now, with that said, there are some things that CSS can't quite handle yet, and it's still easier to do uh, with JavaScript. But instead of, for example, applying you know, .hide or .show, where it's just doing display block and display none inline, instead replace that with add class and remove class, where you're adding a hidden state or removing a hidden state, because then your CSS can be designed to do what it needs to do, and your JavaScript can be designed to do what it needs to do. And it just makes things a lot easier to do. Um, I, I ran into a project, um, actually one of the things that we were doing at, at Yahoo, where we had our CSS, everything looked great at the prototype, we delivered it, and they filed a bug report. Uh, this particular form isn't displaying properly. Okay, well that seems weird because you know, our prototype looks great. And it turned out that the JavaScript developer, to save himself the effort, just did a bunch of inline styles. He just added them manually with JavaScript instead of going back and saying, I'm gonna actually create some CSS to do this. He took the shortest route to solve that problem. And as a result, of course, it overrode all the stuff that we had written. Uh, so we had to refactor that to remove those inline styles so that we can still modify and prototype things at the CSS level. So this is, again, why we want to try to keep our concerns separated. You know, we, we see this with MVC architectures. Um, we know about this, you know, when we talk about behavior from content, from, uh, from design, that we want to keep all these things separate. The same thing really does apply at that, those minute levels, you know, at the JavaScript, to make sure that we're applying things uh, like that. And then with theming, that we have you know, uh, a theme prefix, and if we're you know, separating our text styles, that we have a text prefix. So the naming convention that I use has certain things that I, I, I'm trying to deal with. So I have uh, my module name, doesn't use any hyphens, but is always the root node. So whenever I see a class without any hyphens, I know that's the root of my module. And then if I see a submodule, that does have a hyphen between the two, but no hyphens in the submodule name, no hyphens in the module name. That hyphen separates those two things. But if I see that submodule name with that module name, again, I know it's a submodule, I know that those things are related, and they're part of the same thing. And then lastly, I, if I have a subcomponent, so if I see an HTML element that doesn't have this class naming convention, that I know that's a subcomponent, and I know that I can actually look up my DOM tree and I'm gonna find that HTML element. I can tell that they're all related. Now there are other naming conventions that people use. Um, there is um, a, a group out of uh, Russia actually um, that have developed something called BEM, stands for Block Element Modifier, and the naming convention they use is very similar to this. You know, they'll allow for hyphens, uh, but they actually use double hyphens to separate submodules from modules, and they use double underscores to separate subcomponents from the others. Um, another naming convention that I've seen um, allows for camel case to separate words um, using single hyphen for submodules and double hyphens for subcomponents. Really, whatever naming convention you use doesn't really matter except you need to pick a system that works for you and for your team. Um, be consistent, of course. And lastly, consider the fact that you do have these three different types of components. That you have your root node, you have variations on that node, 
or your submodules, and then you have subcomponents, these uh, child nodes of that particular root. Um, and these are the different elements that we want to style and keep together. Okay, so last topic, decoupling CSS from HTML. This example, again, probably looks very familiar, uh, where we've got this horizontal nav, looks very straightforward, the HTML for it, very predictable. I'm sure this looks very familiar to all of you. But, you know, the, the client comes back and says, I don't like the fact that users have to click on products. Why can't they just hover, get a lovely little drop-down menu to get what they want? Okay, so we add that HTML in, very straightforward, and then we start looking at the CSS that we have to create for this. Well, the problem is, is that when I have these list items inside of list items, I, they can't be floated anymore, so I need to remove the floats that I had in there. I'm creating new CSS to override the CSS that I had before because I have a different visual style, a different visual pattern that I'm creating that I don't want. And same thing with the li link styles inside the list items, inside the list item. You know, we, we start to see this list item inside a list item, a list out a list item, in order to get the different styles that we want. So how many of you still have to deal with IE6? Oh, a couple, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, for anybody else, thankfully, who doesn't have to deal with IE6 anymore, uh, we have child selectors, and child selectors are fantastic because they limit the scope of our CSS. That the list item that we care about is only the direct descendant of that nav element. Uh, we don't care about anything else below it. And what that does is it isolates the impact of our CSS. And this is what I'm talking about when I mean decoupling CSS from HTML. That because of um, using the child selector, the descendant selector as we were before, it was impacting all these HTML elements that we didn't want them to impact. So by using the correct selectors, uh, we limit that impact. We separate our concerns um, and isolate the, the styles for one particular thing. And then what we want to do is define a different visual pattern. So I've created a different class, in this case, the menu class, and I want to style that because it is a different visual pattern than the one I was using before. So, if nothing else today, use child selectors because um, they're pretty awesome. Okay, so another really quick example that I'll go through is, um, let's say I have a box, right? And inside that box, I've got a heading and I've got some content. And I've only got one of these, and so I can kind of, well, I know what the HTML looks like. So instead of adding a bunch of classes everywhere, I'm just gonna say I've got my box heading and my box uh, unordered list. But of course, you know, client comes back and says, well, that one box looks great, but I wanna add some more boxes to the page. You know, maybe I have an about us, maybe I have um, a sponsored by uh, section on there. But you'll start to notice that the HTML is a little bit different. Now I've got paragraphs, now I've got divs. Again, one way to solve this is to just add more selectors, right? As long as, you know, I'm not adding any more, this will work. But if we have new HTML that's coming in, if we have HTML that is unpredictable, this gets a little unwieldy. What we want to do is then start adding a class to make things predictable. So where my HTML wasn't predictable, I'm adding a class to make things predictable. And then I can just apply that class to each of the elements. So applying a class when the HTML can't or won't be predictable. Now, one of the other ways that I would probably have solved this problem is to actually make the HTML predictable. One of the ways that I would have done that is actually wrapping each of these different pieces with a div and applying the, uh, the box body class to that. So in this case, I've got my div already, that's great. In here, I had a paragraph. I would probably wrap that in a div and apply the, the box body. And here, also apply the box body to the div such that the contents that variation between these different modules, again, I don't care about that. I want to separate those concerns, isolate the content from the module itself. The module has the body, and I don't want to care about the contents that are going in that. So by separating that, making the HTML more predictable uh, would give me something that is more maintainable. So what does this all mean? To me, it's about shifting your thinking. Shifting it away from coding for the page and coding it for a system. Uh, there's a, a great article um, out there um, by Dave Rupert, wrote it a few weeks ago, called uh, Responsive Deliverables. Um, 
definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, and in it, he talks about uh, one of the projects that they had worked on with Microsoft and all the uh, components of the page um, and uh, how they built this system and allowing them to really actually work well within a responsive system. And for me, I look at this as uh, what I call state-based design. And I, I, thinking in this way has really shifted my thinking of how to style components. And to me, state-based design includes a number of different things. So one is you've got a layout or module style. And then we have sub-modules in the sense that we have these variations on a particular module. We have JavaScript-driven states, so those state classes that we saw before. Uh, they also include pseudo-class states, so hover, focus, active. These are all representing user interaction. These are all states that we need to plan for and style. And we also have media query states. So with media query states that we have, you know, with responsive designs or adaptive web designs, where we're changing things around, at what point does that state change? And how does it need to reflect that in the design? How does the layout change? How do the modules change? So I love this example. This is a, a cool game called CSS Panic. You can see there's little alligators that slide out. You click on them, a uh, little counter up at the top, a little timer at the bottom. The thing that really impresses me about this is that this is all done completely with CSS. There is not one line of JavaScript that drives this whole thing. And this is, to me, where CSS is going. I remember when CSS animations first came out, I wrote a blog post. I'm like, CSS animations do not belong in CSS. This is a JavaScript thing. This is behavior. And it, it became the shift in understanding that, you know what? CSS animations are actually a great way of describing state. So those alligators, for example, that come out, those are enemies. But you'll notice something that they do here. We're using a prefix here, but we're using the appearance uh, style to change it to look as a button. And the reason for that is because these are actually checkboxes. And checkboxes are notoriously difficult to style. And so they use that WebKit appearance to change the stylability of that checkbox so that they can actually make it look like an alligator. And so when they click on the alligator, you're just clicking on a checkbox. You're changing this state. This, this is a pseudo class state that we're changing. And as a result of that, then we modify the animations, the opacity, pointer events to essentially make it so that you can no longer click on this particular alligator. And again, this is what I mean by like state-based design where that alligator, that animation said, okay, in this particular state, it's just gonna move in and out. And the moment I check on it, I'm gonna change that state. It's gonna look different. And then as a result of that, we can change the counter. We can have these different components on the page that interact in different ways. Going back to that example with the show hide, you know, if we're adding a class or removing a class, and we now have the ability to use CSS animations, when I add a hidden class, maybe instead of just disappearing off the page, we use a CSS animation for it to fade off the page or move off the page, that we can do all these other things with it, where at the JavaScript level, I don't care. All I have to do is come in, apply a class, and that's everything that I need to do. Whereas at the CSS level, I can define what those states do, what happens when I transition in and out of those states. And I definitely feel like this is the direction that we're moving with, with CSS, and the, the more powerful it gets, the more we want to approach things in this way. So three things that I talked about, categorization, naming convention, and decoupling HTML from CSS. Um, you can definitely check out the book at smacks.com, and if you want, um, you can use the discount code ATMOSPHERE and save 50%. So we've got a couple minutes, uh, so if you guys have uh, any questions. Don't be shy. Excellent. So earlier you were talking about, um, about testing CSS separately because you have these isolated components. So how did you go about doing that? Do you mean you have some build process that puts together all these modules, but you have a separate HTML file that, that has uh, modal and box and button and everything that you should go through, or how does that work? Yeah, that's exactly what we did. Um, so one of the problems with, uh, maybe not problems, most companies that have a, a sort of a monolithic project, um, you can imagine trying to do a build process, 
Um, at Yahoo, we had specific build boxes. It would take you like five to 10 minutes. And so to test CSS on that, to then take your changes, deploy them to the box, do the build, and actually run those tests, that, that, that takes a long time. If all you've done is suddenly change the CSS property, okay, well now wait me 10 minutes before I can actually hit refresh on the browser. That's a very time consuming process. So we actually built our own prototyping engine that uh, with the prototyping engine, all it did is it take, took our templates, which were mustache templates, and we used partials to refer to other files. So we would have, our, let's say a modal dialog. This is our modal template. And then with that, we would mash in a JSON uh, mock object that would like, here's all our example data to populate this. So we didn't need to worry about an actual API. We just take in this mock data, take in our language strings, build this HTML file, and preview that on the page. And based on naming convention, we could automatically include the CSS that we needed. Uh, I'm a big fan of convention over configuration, right? If you're a big fan of Rails, that, that concept of naming convention, uh, we did that, we pulled that into the file structure as well, so that when we uh, named things, all we had to do was build out that template, and I could see just what that one component looked like. It would automatically pull in all the files, not only all the template files, all the language strings, all the mock data, and all the CSS that I needed to view just that one component. So it made it a lot easier for us to work with. Anyway, I have now run out of time. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. <laughs>